appreciate the fact that you've taken time out of your very busy schedule on such a short notice to be here this evening. And I know that the Twinsburg Schools um, has a calendar that's packed. And so if we uh, step on somebody's event this evening, our apologies, there really isn't a great night that isn't busy with some athletic event or something else going on here. So thank you for stepping aside from your very busy uh, family world to participate in this evening's conversation about school, school safety and security. You know, we um, are very proud of the academic achievements of our students, but before we can even get to that, to celebrating um, how wonderfully talented our students are, we have to make sure that our school grounds are as safe and secure as they possibly can be. And over time, we have evolved as a school district, and we've talked a little bit about the evolution of our school security procedures over time. Uh, but before we get to that, I'd like to ask our board president, Mr. Mark Curtis, to come forward. He has a few words for you this evening. So yeah, good evening. Uh, and I'll echo uh, you know, what Mrs. Powers has uh, said. Uh, this is really, um, Putting, off, putting this off was a matter of really a, a priority. Uh, uh, we weren't really looking at convenience per se, but you know, given some of the circumstances that have happened uh, you know, in the past couple of weeks, we thought it was uh, necessary uh, for us to engage the community uh, to kind of uh, talk about a lot of the things that we are doing in the district currently, uh, some of the things that we are planning to do, and some plans that we have you know, in place uh, to, to implement. It's just important, you know, to engage you guys and let you know, you know, kind of what's going on in the district, especially around uh, safety uh, and security. Uh, please understand and know and recognize that uh, the board uh, takes the safety and security of all staff and students very seriously. Uh, it, it is of the utmost importance to us. Uh, and so we've had uh, a lot of conversation uh, around things that we can do, mechanisms that we can uh, take advantage of. Uh, and you know actions uh, that, 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 that we can take as a board, so we continue to communicate with the superintendent and collaborate in all respects uh, regarding safety and security. So uh, the presentation that you uh, will, will see this evening will kind of speak to again a lot of the things that we're doing, our partnership with all of our communities and our safety forces, uh, and, I, and obviously uh, we definitely want your feedback uh, as a community. Uh, if you have noticed. Uh, any and all major initiatives uh, that we have in the district, we send out surveys. Uh, we value your feedback. It's important to us. And we want to make sure that the things that we do and employ uh, are supported uh, by you, the community. So without further ado, I'll turn the, things, uh, uh, turn the presentation back over to the superintendent so that we can jump into things and get down to business. So thank you very much for your attendance. Thank you, Mr. Curtis. Uh, this evening, um, our program is going to be presented uh, by four individuals, uh, by Mr. Brian Lynn, our high school principal, by Dr. Andrea Walker, our director of student wellness, by Matt Strickland, who is our new business manager, and, and by, by me. And so uh, we're going to offer you um, information about what we're currently doing here in the school district with regard to school safety and security. And at, at midpoint of the presentation, our school resource officer from Twinsburg High School, um, Officer Ron Priscilla, will also address some of the protocols that we have in place, not only at the high school, but throughout our school district. And I, I, I know that you'll enjoy hearing from him as well. Um, Mr. Curtis was here um, introducing himself. I'd also like to introduce um, a couple of other board members who are here. Uh, Mrs. Tina Davis, who is our uh, vice president of the Board of Education and Mrs. Rhonda Crawford, who is a member of our board. Thank you for being here. Also here tonight is Chief Tom Mason of the Twinsburg Police Department. Um, there he is. And the members of our district uh, administrative leadership team are here as well. Thank you for being here tonight, everybody. I know that this is a night out, and I appreciate your um, attendance and um, your support as always. Um, before we get underway with the program, I just wanted to give you a little housekeeping. Um, when you walked in the door tonight, you were provided an index card. Um, if you have a question that you would like to pose, we ask you to please write your question on the index card and raise your hand and a member of my administrative staff, Mrs. 
Muriel in particular will come pick them up from you. And near the end of the program, we'll, uh, we'll have a chance to answer the questions that are presenting, are being presented this evening. So if you haven't picked up a card, there are some on the back table, um, or raise your hand and Mrs. Muriel can uh, get one for you if you need that. Um, so let's begin to talk about school safety and the continuum that gets us to 2022. Um, we talk about Columbine, um, and that is the kickoff point, I think, of modern day school safety protocols. But there are four that are more recent than Columbine that really has, as a school district, caused us to stop and think about school safety protocols and what are we doing here within the walls of the Twinsburg City School District. First, and one that was the closest to us was Chardon High School in February of 2012. And then shortly thereafter, I think all of us were just shaken to the board or core uh, when Sandy Hook Elementary School had the tragedy there in December of 2012. And then in 2018, right before the pandemic, uh, we were hearing about the tragedy in Parkland at um, Major E. Stoneman Douglas High School. And then, of course, uh, just last May, um, the tragedy at Robb Elementary School in Uvalde, Texas, um, really caused us to stop in our tracks. And for every single one of those tragedies, I can tell you as an administrative group, we pull together and we say, what else do we need to do? What lessons can, can be learned from somebody else's situation that can help us be stronger as a school family? And we spent a lot of time over the summer, especially dissecting what happened in Uvalde, to try to ensure that the tragedy that was there is not replicated itself here in our school district. So we learn lessons from others as we move forward as a school family. The one thing I can tell you is that we are extremely blessed by our partnership with the Twinsburg Police and Fire Department the Reminderville uh, Fire and Police Department and the Sheriff's Office. I can tell you, I can tell you from personal experience, every single time that we have had a situation here, be it just a rumor, be it a factual incident, we have never doubted the fact that our partners across the street or in Reminderville or the Sheriff's Office wouldn't be here to help us. Uh, this past Thursday during the situation that happened at Twinsburg High School, Upon my arrival here with my business manager, we had active police engaged on the campus of the school. Didn't wait for me to get here, didn't wait for anybody. They came in, they did what they needed to do. And so that's the kind of community that we have here and we are very blessed in our community. We all shake our heads when we hear about the report that was filed regarding Robb Elementary School. And I think in my brain, how could that even have happened? Because in my experience, I know that wouldn't happen here. I can guarantee you that wouldn't happen. I just had a conversation with Officer Fido in the back of the room, and thank you for being here this evening. And he was telling me how they train for single officers to go into the school and to figure out what the situation is. They don't wait for somebody to come up behind them. They don't wait for a group of officers to be here. They are here and they move in individually. And we're very fortunate in our school district to have that kind of partnership with our friends across the street and in Reminderville and in the township. Yes, thank you very much. So I want to just share a few things that I can with regard to procedures and protocols that we have here in place. Some of these you may know about and some of these might be new to you, but these are some of the things that we have worked on over the course of many years to make sure that we have safety and security as a, a forefront of our thinking. First and foremost, um, right after Sandy Hook happened, we knew that our portals to our schools needed to be better secured. And so we thankfully had a board of education that said, do what you need to do. And uh, we uh, created the welcome centers. It did not go with a lot, uh, without a lot of concern because prior to that, our parents were used to just coming into the school, right? But the world had changed and we had to do something. And so our welcome centers and our lobby guard system was installed right after the Sandy Hook incident. So that would have been the 14, 15 school year. Each year, um, we, sub uh, we submit something called an emergency management plan. And those plans um, are confidential in nature. So I really can't say too much about them. What, what I can tell you 
is it is the structure, the infrastructure of our school emergency response. Um, it is built in cooperation with our local law uh, and fire uh, services. They review our plans. So if we have a bad day here in the district, and I hope that we never do, the plans are well defined. They're maps. The police officers have access to them. They would be able to identify a point in which we would have a perpetrator in the school. And if you walk around any of our buildings, you would notice numbers on doors and numbers on windows. There is a purpose for that. Because if somebody were inside of the classroom and said, um, situation in classroom N17 at RB Chamberlain Middle School, police officers can call that up on their maps. They know where the perpetrator is. And it's just um, a way of them being able to manage a crisis situation. Um, we have door fobs for our staff members. I also want to let you know that the Twinsburg police officers share the same fobs with us. So if we have a situation for which there is an emergency, any patrol officer can access any of our schools through the fob access. They're not waiting for somebody in the Welcome Center to let them in. They're not waiting for an administrator to greet them at the door. They're inside our schools. So uh, we appreciate uh, Chief Mason. Um, suggesting the idea, and uh, that has um, happened here. We have Mark's radios at each of our school district buildings, and what that is, is they're located near the Welcome Centers, and uh, that is our communication with Summit County, and so if there is a situation that occurs um, here in the school district, uh, the Mark's radios will help with the communication, not only with our police department, but in a broader sense, and that brings assistance where we need it as quickly as possible. We currently have school resource officers here at the high school and RB Chamberlain Middle School. Officer Priscilla has been here at the high school for many years, and so I'm sure many of you know him. And we have a new officer at RB Chamberlain, whose name is Nate Milholm. If you haven't met Nate, I hope you do. He's a wonderful person who cares deeply about kids and safety. And so he's joined our staff this year. We also have uh, SRO Craig Bremner, who is our SRO and he's assigned to the three elementary schools at this point in time. I can tell you as I speak tonight, um, Chief Mason has been working with his department to secure additional school resource officers for our school district. It's a process, things don't happen overnight. And so we appreciate his efforts in helping us to get that done. And it's the Board of Education's desire to have a school resource officer at each of our schools. And so that work is underway. And we appreciate Chief and his department working along with us to ensure that an officer will soon be at each of our schools. I can tell you that any day of the week, you may find a police officer's vehicle parked outside the school. Doesn't mean anything is going on. When they're under patrol, they walk the halls of our schools. They get to know the kids. And during that time, they're also getting to know our facility. So in the event that we would have a crisis here, they know where the commons are at the high school. They know where the labs are at the middle school. They know where the gym is at uh, Wilcox Primary School. And at the same time, the kids get to see the officers up and close as friends to them and there to support them. And so we appreciate our road patrol officers who are in and out of our buildings all the time. When we um, first institutionalized this, it would have been right after Sandy Hook under the direction of Chief Chris Noga. And he said, no, I want my officers to be in the buildings. And Chief Mason has continued uh, that tradition. And we're very grateful for the support of the Twinsburg Police Department. Currently, we have two security liaisons here at the high school. That would be Anthony Bird and Phil Schmuck. Um, they both wear multiple hats during the day. They're security in the evening is out coach. So you, I'm sure if you're a high school parent, you know who both gentlemen are. The Board of Education has asked us to secure the employment of five additional security liaisons. Um, and the purpose behind those uh, new employees would be this. We do a pretty good job during the school day. We have school resource officers. We're getting additional school resource officers hopefully soon. But what happens when the dismissal bell rings? We've got kids on this campus in and out and all about. We have kids on the campus, baseball fields, soccer fields, over across the way to Tiger Stadium. And while the coaches are watching the kids on the field, nobody's necessarily watching in and out and who's in the stands and who's coming and going. And so the board has authorized these liaisons, first and foremost, to cover our after-school activities. Uh, one will be here watching the in and out of volleyball, perhaps one will be at the middle school where Mr. Reese might have wrestling going in and out. 
or whatever, and then the rest will be outside during the fall. In the winter season, where things switch inside, uh, those uh, office or liaison schedules will be switched so that they will be additional security during the school day on our campuses. And then in the spring, when things go back outside again, uh, we'll flip back to having the, the, the extra eyes outside on the campus with our kids as they do the great things they do after hours. I appreciate the Board of Education for authorizing those additional employees because, again, we do a pretty good job during the school day. Um, always room for improvement, admittedly, but it's after school that we have to be concerned and we just have to do a little bit more there. Um, all of our doors have those numbers, and uh, Mr. Strickland, who is our new business manager, has been working hard all summer making sure that the locks on every single door here throughout our district, we have a lot of doors, as you can imagine, making sure that all of the locks on all of the doors are working the right way. Um, we found some soft spots recently, so he's busy working with a door company to get them fixed. Uh, but what we heard through the tragedy of Rob Elementary School was we had doors that didn't lock and they weren't tended to. So lesson learned here over the summer, that was one of the pushes that we had here in, in Twinsburg is an audit of all of our doors, making sure that what should lock does lock, who has access has access. And so I appreciate Mr. Strickland and, and Mr. Summers, who's our maintenance uh, supervisor, who's been working behind the scenes to make sure all of the doors are locking appropriately. Um, on our buses, you know we have our Z passes and our stop finder technology, which was introduced within the last year. I can tell you why Z pass happened. It was the first day of school four years ago, and it was when the RACs first started their after school program, their after care. And one of our little ones got confused as to where she was supposed to be. RAC employees thought she wasn't coming. We thought she was going. Parents didn't know exactly where they had told the child to go. We were missing a kid for a little bit of time. Scariest thing ever, right? So we figured we had to do something different. And so immediately thereafter, we started to do these paper cards that drove the administrators bonkers at the elementary school collecting cards and resorting them all the time. Fast forward, COVID happened, and we knew we couldn't have all that paper in kids' hands. Even if you give kids paper, where does it go? In their mouths, right? So just what it is when you're working with little ones. So through the efforts of Mr. Mark Desmond, who's my transportation supervisor, and Mrs. Tracy um, Abbott, our assistant transportation supervisor, the Z-Pass technology was introduced. And so kids swipe on when they get on the bus, they swipe off when they get on the bus, you know, who's on the bus, when they get off the bus, and should we have a student missing, or there's a report of, I can't find my son or daughter after school, it's a quick call to transportation, they can tell me if that child was on the bus and where they got off the bus on any given day. And so Z-Pass has a, a, been a blessing to us here at the school district. Um, Stop Finder has mixed reviews. If you're a parent, uh, you might love it or you hate it. Um, Um, I think the bigger issue that we're dealing with right now is the need for additional bus drivers. And if you happen to know of anyone who wants to be a bus driver for Twin Park Schools, please give our HR department a call. Um, buses have had a slow start and the stop finder technology has been helpful to some families and maybe not to others. But the purpose behind stop finder is so that parents know if they're at work about the time their child can be expected at home. Um, when the bus will get there to pick their child up or at the end of the day when they're, when they're um, after school. So we still work through some bugs with Stop Finder, but it really was introduced here all as a safety measure for the students of our school district. Over the course of several years, Mr. Matt McGing, our technology supervisor, has been instrumental in ensuring that we have additional school cameras. Um, you never know where there are. They are all over the place, but there's always room to um, improve our security camera um, coverage. And so we continue to look at where some blind spots are, where we want to add that technology, and that's an ongoing thing that we um, actually have come to depend a lot upon the security cameras here in the school district for lots of different reasons. All of our buses and school vans have uh, cameras and um, they help us with school student management. We put some fencing enhancements. If you think about Wilcox Primary School, we didn't used to have that gate that separates the playground from uh, the parking lot on the side of the building. That was a recent enhancement and really helps uh, protect the kids while they're playing on the playground. Um, all of our staff members have ID badges that they're supposed to be wearing. Within these ID badges actually happens to be our door fobs and our copier machine. 
um, access. So they serve dual purposes. And then again, we already mentioned about the doors being numbered at all of the um, school buildings and all of our windows as well. You know, uh, communication is really my thing. And what, where all of my staff members are busy taking care of lots of different responsibilities, communication really falls many times directly on, on me to make sure that you're getting consistent, factual, timely information that's as transparent as we can be. And I admittedly, um, when we had a situation over at the high school uh, last Thursday, um, I should have made a phone call. I said to you a Blackboard Connect message. I apologize for that. You know, you're all working during the day, or many of you are. You don't have time to look at your phone for an email. So we are going to make some adjustments. But just so you know, behind the scenes, we have a district communications plan. Um, if you are uh, familiar with communication in general, there's an organization out of uh, the Cleveland area called Hannes Communications. They are the driving force with communications in the big sense. When there's a big crisis in a community like Cleveland, they go to Hannes to help figure out the best way to communicate. Well, the Hannes organization actually, I think about three or four years ago, helped us define our crisis communication protocols. So we have those in place. We know how we will operate if we have a crisis. And that particular document is an evolving document because just like I mentioned to you, my misstep last Thursday, we're back in that crisis book looking to see what else do we need to improve should we have a crisis here in our, our school community. Of course, we have Blackboard Connect, we have Blackboard Email. The district website it is, it was upgraded just last year. Our mobile app is up and running. If you haven't logged on to that, I hope that you do. It is a great way to communicate with the school district. You get daily updates about what's going on here. And of course, um, I have my Twitter as well as the district Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook accounts. So we really do try to communicate with you a lot, almost to the point that sometimes I think it's an oversaturation um, from me sending out uh, correspondence. But I think, too, you'd rather have more information than not information. And you can always decide you don't want to read an email. But we've come to at least sending home a weekly update to you. I try to do that on Sunday morning or Sunday evening. You can pretty much expect one from me every Sunday because it sets the tone for the week. You know what's coming up. And of course, if we have a situation that you need information for, we communicate uh, to you um, at the point of uh, time that we can. Additional things that have happened with regard to school safety and security, we've learned a lot about drop off and pick up. And my three elementary schools have a tag system. If you have a younger child in our district, you know that Ms. Villa and Mrs. Johnson and Mr. Holland and their assistant principals have done a yeoman's job of figuring out the best way, the safest, most secure way of drop off and pick up for students. Miss Villa is moving 700 kids within a half hour in the morning. That's a lot of little bodies. And a lot of those children at the beginning of the year don't know how to do school yet. They haven't been in a school environment. And so it's a lot of repetitive conversation with the boys and girls. And on top of that, trying to get them out of cars and get them in school, and we have buses moving in the front of the buildings. So arrival and dismissal is a big task, and I applaud my elementary staff members for what they do in my transportation department, because um, they keep the safety of the kids at the forefront. Sometimes it goes a little slowly, and I appreciate your patience in those circumstances, especially as we get underway in the school year, when all the students are learning new routines, no matter what grade level they happen to be in. In a few minutes, Dr. Walker will talk to you a little bit more about the Safe Schools Helpline, but I did want to point that out, that that has become a very important tool in our school district. We receive messages through the Safe Schools Helpline, which then send the administrative team investigating circumstances which may or may not be factual. We get a lot of things that are just rumors, but sometimes we get things that we have to look into. Sometimes we have to connect with the City of Twinsburg Police Department and others. It, it truly depends on the circumstance. But if you hear something, say something. And that's what that's about. Those are the credos that we ask our kids to live by. And so Andrea will talk about that in a little bit. And then what I want to say is that we are so blessed with the location of our school district compared to where our city services happen to be, right across the street, you know, right down the road. And so in any circumstance, the response time that we get here in the district 
hands down, probably better than most communities in Northeast Ohio. For that, we are grateful uh, for the help of our city um, services. Um, before I proceed, I want to thank uh, Chief Tim Morgan. I see that you just came in uh, this evening. Chief is our fire chief in the city of Twinsburg. Um, he has been most helpful in his staff in making sure that we, we follow fire code. Anytime Matt and John have a construction project going on, the fire inspectors are here making sure that we are doing it right. Uh, we had a project over at Dodge where we, we divided up the band room and the orchestra room into two classrooms and the um, uh, vocal music classroom into two classrooms to accommodate a growing number of kids at Dodge. And we knew we had to put some lockers down. What uh, once was a dead hallway. Um, Chief Morgan's staff came over, gave us great advice. Lockers were purchased. We did it the right way. We could have guessed, but we don't do that. Thanks to Chief Morgan and his staff, we do it because we have partners that tell, tell us how to do things by the code to ensure the safety of our kids. So Chief, thank you very much. On October 5th, um, the school district will participate in a very significant uh, drill. It's a full-scale drill. Uh, we are doing this in partnership with Twinsburg Fire, Twinsburg Police specifically, additionally Reminderville, City of Reminderville, and Summit County Emergency Services. What we want to do is we want to test our emergency response systems. And so on that particular day, we will not have students that is a day-to-day, -day, uh, but the staff will be reporting to work. What we will be asking for would be high school juniors and seniors who want to earn some community hours to participate in the drill as students. And then we're going to ask parents uh, to uh, participate as well. This is the reason why. One of the things that we know is a soft spot, and we learned a little bit about this last Thursday during the incident here at the high school. And I thank Mr. Uh, Strickland and the staff, the administrative assistant staff here at the building and security. Um, when we had that incident happen last Thursday, what parents want to do is they want to rush to make sure their, their child's okay. And so that reunification and the process that you go to to make sure that this student is connected back to that parent is not as easy as it sounds like it should be. It's pretty technical. And so during the crisis drill on October 5th, the main part that we're going to test as a school district will be our reunification piece. If we have a crisis at any of our buildings, what is going to happen in our community? It's going to be traffic jam, log jam on Ravenna Road, on Glenwood, or 91. Two lane roads, imagine in your mind, all of the police, all of the fire, all of the media who just happened to swarm in, right? And then all the parents who want their kids, and my staff who want to get home and their loved ones who are rushing to them. It will be just a disastrous scene. And so in our processes here, we know that if we have a situation, and Officer Purcell is gonna talk about Alice, and the kids are gonna get out of the building as quickly and safely as possible, we want to practice the reunification that would happen. I'm very happy to tell you that in our community, we have a partnership with Mayor Sam Alonzo from Reminderville. In the event that we would have a crisis here in our community, the reunification point is the Reminder of the Athletic Club. It's large enough to hold our student population, spacious enough, and so for the drill on October 5th, we're going to practice that reunification. How is it going to go? Who is going to be supporting reunifying parents and kids and staff members and loved ones? And so as a parent, if you are interested in participating that day, Especially if you have a high school junior or senior and you want them to participate in it as well. I will soon be sending out a survey to our families to ask if you want to do that. Your participation will help us understand what we do well and what we really need to fix and, and uh, consider moving forward. Reunification is a big deal, especially when you're dealing with the emotion of what is happening in crisis. And so we learned some things last Thursday, the reunification happened here. We didn't have a situation where kids were running out of the school. They were all here, they were all fine. But we still had parents who wanted their kids, and a lot of parents. And so the staff had to diligently work through that reunification process and learn a lot of things through Thursday's experience. So we'll be practicing that on a larger scale on October 5th. You'll be hearing more about that uh, 
from me as we move forward. But again, it's just another layer of security, making sure our processes and practices are in place. So in the event we have a situation kicked off, we know what we're doing and our parents understand what they need to do to get reunified with their child. Um, next is our ALICE drills, and I want to introduce our school resource officer, Officer Ron Frisella. Officer Frisella has been our trainer of, of the ALICE um, initiative. Gosh, I think I've been here 13 years, so at least 11, maybe 12. Um, we have been doing ALICE here for a long time, and it was through the work of um, Ron Frisella, and at that time, uh, Greg Kopniski and Dan Vianna has also helped us with drills, and we've had friends from Aurora Police Department who've been here too. Uh, but I wanted to ask Ron to come forward and just explain to you a little bit about what ALICE is, how we train our staff, how we train our parents, and just give you a little background. Not necessarily. Okay. Good evening. For you that know me, my name is Ron Fusola. I am a Twinsburg police officer. Um, and I can't stand behind that podium or use that mic because I'm a purebred Italian. I talk with my hands and I move a lot. So, bear with me. I'm a police officer here in Twinsburg. It's my 27th year. The great news is I've spent the last 20 years as a school resource officer right here in this high school. It's probably been the best job you could have as a police officer in, in my mind. It wasn't something that I set out to do, but it, it, it's, it's, I ended up getting there, and then when I, as I got here, I fell in love with that. We didn't even know what school resource officers really were 20 years ago and what our roles was. I actually had to go to Fort Indian Town Gap, Pennsylvania, almost to the New York, in the New York, to go to school to become a school resource officer, because in Ohio, they weren't even doing it. And I remember, the first questions and you know we talk about how we've evolved well the first questions that came up were are you going to carry a gun yeah going to do that and they had all it was all what about why are we putting police officers in our school so if we just if we just kind of talk a little bit about how we got here 20 years ago we were talking about our police officers even going to carry a gun in the school and today we want to talk about how many police officers can we put in the school Mrs. Powers kind of talked about Columbine. That was, the, that was the kickoff. That was when the Fed finally said, we need to do more. And you know, local law enforcement, we always kind of follow suit as to what happens at the federal level. And now we're kind of taking the, the beginning. Of, we're, we're the forefront of it. But I can tell you just a little quick about history. Um, first of all, I am a father. I'm a parent. I've had three kids come through this high school. Two of them, two of my oldest daughters have graduated from here. My son is a senior here. So not only am I a police officer, not only am I a school resource officer, but I am one of you. I'm a parent. And it's, I'm as passionate about it as you are as far as safety and security for our schools. 20 years ago, when police officers came to a crisis, any crisis, school, hospital, church, whatever, real quick history, we as police officers were the first responders. We were trained to get there, surround the building, and wait for SWAT. Well, it's not TV. Anybody know how long it takes to get as good a SWAT team? Officer Fido back there, he is one of our SWAT officers. He will tell you that the SWAT officers are the best of the best, and I agree with him. They are the best of the best. I've trained with them my whole career. But to get those guys here, they have a different job to do. And I will tell you, in the worst day ever, in an active shooting scenario in a high school, every seven seconds, a gun gets discharged. So if it takes a, an hour for a SWAT team to assemble, you know how many seven seconds are in an hour? It's a lot, okay? As we move forward, just a quick little take on what police departments do, we went from, Mrs. Powers actually even talked about, about soul engagement, but we went from us being the first responders just waiting so the SWAT guys get here, to then years ago, 15 years ago, the, the chief at the time said to me, Ron, you're going to go learn how to train our guys how to get into a school, how to get into an active shooting situation, and find the bad guy and defuse the situation. It's going to take four of you. You have to train in, in fours to go in. And then something else happened, and we realized four was too many. 
too long every seven seconds. Then we went to, the chief said, hey, we got a new plan. You and somebody else are gonna go. First two guys you get there, they go. But we realized it takes too long every seven seconds. Years ago, Chief came to me and said, you're gonna be a sole engagement instructor. You're gonna come back and teach these guys how to go do it yourself. Because you're already there, right? And these guys come and get there. Now the good news is I've turned it over to the young guys. Officer Fight on the back of the room. He is, these guys are top notch. And they are, they are all on top of the new training. They are on top of the new technology. We are all there, we're all about that. So that's a little bit about law enforcement and where we've come in just a few short years, really in 20 years, in my career as a school resource officer, from coming to a, to a, to a bad situation and waiting to moving forward and doing it and having to do it because that's our job. That's our job. So Power is alluded to Alice training. Alice is nothing more than what I would like to call, and I have colleagues here in the room that I notice are police officers and they do the same thing that I do in training. They have the police officers in other jurisdictions, they have kids here and in other jurisdictions. And, and we none of us believe it's the greatest thing since sliced bread. But what we do know is it's a common sense approach and it's an option-based approach to keeping our kids as safe as they can. All it really is, is this is just an acronym and it's alert, lockdown, inform, counter, and evacuate. And really it's a three-tiered three approach. Three-tiered approach. The safest approach is if we had our worst day ever here is our kids got out of the building. Now we're talking about the high school. Now we train from the fourth grade up we train from the fourth grade up, and it's a little unique because sixth grade is where they wanted to start. They thought the kids were, that's where they were mentally prepared to do that. When I first started teaching this many, many, many years ago, I had a son who was in fourth grade. And I said, well, I believe he can do this. I believe he can do everything we're teaching the sixth graders to do. And we were so unique here because our fourth, fifth, and sixth grade are in the same building. We didn't want to teach sixth graders to do something and fourth and fifth graders to do something else. So we train here from the fourth grade up. Now, we have protocols in place all the way from Wilcox all the way up, but it's our staff that is trained, as well as our staff all the way through the district, and our staff then directs our young, our children what to do, okay? So really it's just a three-tier approach. One is to evacuate. We know that is the safest thing in the world to do. If you can get out, get out. The second thing part is, um, to barricade yourself in, the actual lockdown piece. Barricade yourself in, create time, because local law enforcement is already on scene or they are coming. The last piece to do, which is the counter, which is very controversial, and we teach it, we explain it to our people, and it's, if it's a last ditch effort, mano a mano, what do you do, how do you try to get yourself to a safe place, how do you end a bad situation, okay? So we train this, we train all our kids this, we train all our staff that, and we believe that it is a common sense approach and gives our staff and our students the best chance to survive if we ever have the worst day ever. Now nobody wants to talk about having the worst day ever, but it's like being a police officer and training every month to shoot your firearm. We used to just stand and shoot at a piece of paper when I first started 27 years ago. We'd stand right here and shoot that piece of paper, but man, look how proficient we are, right? And then we realize if you create stress, you're not very good. So the evolvement of being a police officer in the training has come so far from moving and shooting and all these tactical things that we do now, the road guys have to do, right? We have to be much closer to SWAT guys than ever, even though some of us aren't, aren't good enough to get there, but we have to be as good as we can be all the time, right? So we've evolved. We have all these measures in place. But it's not just this facility. Mrs. Powers talked about all the after school stuff. If you're around here in the fall, holy moly, there is stuff going on all over the place. Not only from here, but drive by RBC where you see the little kids outside playing football. We have to, we have to kind of keep that in mind, right? We have buses going all over the place. We keep that in mind. I've trained bus drivers what to do in case somebody tries to get on a bus, what to do if somebody tries to take a bus. We've had those situations happen, thank God, not here, right? But we've had those situations happen across the country where we've had buses get taken with kids out, right? So we have to talk about those things. 
So I'm sure as you kind of sat here and listened to Mrs. Powers this evening, she talked about so many things, about so many things of security that maybe we don't even give any chance to think about because there's so much to digest. There's so much involvement. The other thing that we do is, from last week's scenario, is we have a scenario, we have a little step down thing we call a hold in place. And you might have saw that terminology used. It's a terminology that we kind of came up with, and it's a way that we control the environment. We're not truly in a lockdown situation. We're not truly in a crisis situation yet, but we're getting there. We believe we might be there. So we have a hold in place scenario where our kids know how to act and do the drills. We keep them in the classrooms. They continue to learn while we control the environment. And then these things are so fluid. And like Mrs. Power said, there's so many things going on dynamically from our staff to the law enforcement to central office. Um, during these crisis situations, everybody wants to have information. And I appreciate that. My wife would be the first person to tell you she has no idea what's going on. Because she knows I can't stop and text her and say, I'm in the middle of something, come pick up the kid. Right? You can't, you can't do it. Okay? You can't do it. So as much as we want all that information to come out, we do a great job getting information out in as timely and as fast as we can. But we have to process that information, and we have to get that information out as well. So continue to work on it. We always continue to work on it. Um, in my 20 years here, in my almost 15 years here with Mrs. Powell, we've never been a non-transparent organization. Because what you guys know is pretty much what we know. And we, we want to partner with you because I'm one of those parents. I'm one of those parents. So we are passionate about it as you. We appreciate um, everything that you guys do for us. But I will tell you, all this stuff, all the stuff that we do as law enforcement, all the stuff that our SWAT guys do. Safety and security starts with building relationships. Building relationships with kids. Having our young people to the point where they are, they will trust somebody enough to say something. We have so many layers here from school resource officers to our Beachbrook um, social worker counselors to our school counselors, to our school administrators, to our, believe it or not, our custodial staff who knows kids, coaches. If we continue to build those relationships, we continue to be as safe as we can. I don't care, and I'm just gonna be honest with you, no buildings are designed to keep people out. Prisons are only designed to keep people in. No buildings are designed to keep people out. Metal detectors, bulletproof glass, yada, yada, yada. It's not a reality. The reality is we, can, we have to do as much as we possibly can, be fiscally responsible, put the best people in place to do what we do, and we have that, and then continue to build relationships with our kids. Because I would tell you that they want to be safe when they come to school. They absolutely want to be safe when they come to school. It's where their friends are. Some of them get most of their meals here. They have camaraderie here, and they feel safe. And if we continue to build those relationships, they will tell somebody. And then that stuff filters down to school counselors, uh, security guards, law enforcement, all the above. So here I will tell you that we believe that we are always, always looking for new ways. We are always willing to engage. We are always training. And we are always trying to get better. The reality of it is we need everybody that came out here tonight and more to continue to support your, your, your sons and daughters and to keep talking to them about everyday life. Life has changed. The pandemic has changed again. We're now here to reset and we're starting 
kind of a new, but we have all this great foundation, right? So now kids are learning how to be back in school. Kids are understanding what it takes to be in school. Kids are um, figuring out how hard it is. Remember, we, when we had that pandemic, when we came back to school, we had two grades who never stepped foot in this high school. And that's a big leap of faith, going from middle school in a pandemic, academically to come in here in the high school. And all it does is it created stress for our kids. So much stress. And then it creates stress for our parents, right? Continue to engage your children. Talk to them about these things. Try to get them off the social media. Never gonna happen. <laughs> Never gonna happen. And know who their friends are. Know who their friends are. And I'm just talking to you now as a parent. And I'm just remembering my father speaking to me, and I don't probably don't have to teach anybody here how to be a parent, um, but just the things that were given to me when I was growing up, and I like to give back to, to our kids and our community here. So to me, we do everything we can. We do more than we, than we, than we can. And then we get to a point where, you know what, our kids are, are they're, they're our greatest treasure. They're our greatest treasure. So, I, that's where I'm at. I believe totally that when we get to that point where kids stop feeling safe, we'll know. We'll know. Um, in closing, I don't have another slide, but I'm just gonna tear up this one. Um, in closing, the reality of it is, I believe, I, I could have sent my kids to school anyway. Like you, right? I chose to be in this city. I chose to let my kids come to this town because I saw the things that we were putting in place. And I believe in it. I'm passionate about it. I'm here to do it. And I think I walk the walk. And I think everybody here, administratively, and everybody here from our coaching staff, all the way through would believe that building relationships is our safest way to keep our schools safe. And I also say that in building relationships with our parents and our community. So I think as long as we do that, we go back to what Mr. Power says, see, say, see something, say something. We talk about it all the time. The world has changed. We are going to change with it. We're going to do our best. Um, but we do welcome suggestions. We welcome um, anything that you guys have. So with that, thank you for letting me have 20 minutes of your time. Um, we'll continue. You can always get in touch with me to the school, to the police department. And if you have any questions or concerns about how things operate as far as law enforcement, our school resource officer here, remember, we are not here as a punitive piece. We are not here as a punitive piece. We are here to build relationships. We are here to help. We are here to help. And, and, and I, I've worn many hats here in my 20 years. I've coached multiple sports. From boys and girls golf all the way down, I get to coach the varsity baseball team as an assistant head coach, and I love it, right? That's what it's about. We want to thank you guys for coming. Um, I'm sure I'll be around here later if anybody has any other questions. Um, but thank you, and it's been a great work so far. Have had elevated security concerns at one level or another. 
Um, I would like to say in my 20 years, uh, safety and security kind of went from being a part of the conversation. It was a part of it about 20 years ago, and I'm dating myself a lot more gray hairs now, but it is the conversation now. It is most central conversation. It's something that I care deeply about. Um, I'm a father as well. Um, that, you know, it's the thing that I, you know, when I lay my head down on the pillow at night and when you wake up in the morning, those are the things you think about. Um, and I would also like to say thank you to the board and Mrs. Powers because uh, not every district is doing all of, the, all of the things that I feel like we are. And that is, uh, everyone tries to do them, but I feel like we are consistently um, talking about these things. And I feel like if we're here talking about these things, um, that is the most important piece. Um, there is no right or wrong. There's only analysis and there's only getting better. Uh, and getting better, uh, and I always say with safety and security, we can't miss. Uh, this, in today's world, uh, we need to be 100% on board, uh, practiced, trained, and I believe in our first responders here in Twinsburg. I believe in our administrative team. I believe in our entire team of parents and kids. And I wanna reiterate what Officer Priscilla said. Um, you know, part of that is building relationships um, with our students. Um, you know, when kids feel safe and we want them to feel safe to come to school, uh, I can't imagine what they've gone through. Uh, they see the stories on the news, you see the stories on the news, I see the stories on the news. What they've gone through um, has been difficult, uh, just as, as we kind of increase in modern times. Um, but talking to our kids, making them feel safe, and making you feel safe as a parent, that they can come to school and know that we're implementing procedures, some that we can talk about, some that we cannot talk about, um, but all of these things, and again, no suggestion is a bad suggestion, um, but we need to take all of your feedback into account. So I just wanted to say that as I start. Um, I also wanted to say I don't discount, uh, this was, um, I've been in education 20 years, I've never had a start to the school year like this. Uh, the water main break looks like, a, <laughs> that was really easy on that first day. So, um, but you know, we learned some things even from the water main break um, that I just like to you know highlight with our transportation. And those are things you're moving, you know, at that time 675, you know, 700 kids in and out, and we were able to do that within an hour of you know understanding that there was not um, running water in the building, which is you know that's a less elevated concern. Um, I've been in schools my entire life. I've never been in two home in place lockdown situations in uh, one week. Uh, and I feel that, um, I feel that immensely. Um, and I would like to say to you as, as parents uh, that I, I don't take that responsibility lightly, um, but as uh, the principal of this high school, it is my job to make sure that our students are 100% safe and secure. Uh, and if there's anything that comes into play uh, where I never feel that way, then we will uh, go to a hold in place situation. Uh, and that's not just a Brian Lynn decision, that is a very fluid decision working with our first responders, working with Officer Priscilla, obtaining the most accurate, up-to-date information that we can, and then communicating that to you afterwards. So, uh, and again, I think that we fall back on our training. I think our training is key, um, and it's not just the high school that is going through those trainings. It is our entire administrative team. Uh, those are very difficult things to talk about, uh, but at our administrative retreat this summer, we dissected a uh, principal's message from the Uvalde uh, massacre, and it was very difficult to watch, um, but it was something that I felt that, you know, credit to Superintendent Powers, but we did, and we discussed that, and we discussed what could we do as a team. So those are parts of the discussion. Um, so I just kind of wanted to say that. I'm gonna highlight some areas that we are moving through that we have. Again, I'm sure there are questions. Um, and these are some of the things that we do have in place to ensure a safe and secure environment. Um, you know, you, we, in education, we speak in ac acronyms. Uh, PBIS is one, Positive Behavioral Interventions and Supports. Uh, that's how we actively promote pro-social behavior. Um, that's how we uh, develop those relationships with kids. That's how we talk to kids. We reward those behaviors. Tiger Strong Students of the Week. Our first uh, part of the S is safe. Uh, we want the students to be safe. Uh, we want them to be on time, be engaged. Um, and so we promote those. Uh, we also do have, uh, uh, we have our assistant principals, myself as a principal, where we, we talk to students about behavior if they're not safe. If they're not on time, if they're not where they're supposed to be, those are things that we address. And those are things that have become more and more critical as we've gone throughout the years. Um, you know, maybe back in the day, kiddos skipped a class, like, oh, well, it's just a skip class. Well, we don't have, again, time to miss. We don't have time to second guess. We need to have accurate information about where our kids are. Um, 
So our staff members are vigilant. That's the number one thing I think that I've found uh, as someone who's worked in education, developed relationships with all, all kids from all walks of life, is that you gotta be able to talk to them. Uh, and that sometimes that is the most important piece of information. Like Officer Priscilla said, there's going to be a student at some point in time in the day of any individual that works in a school where a student may tell you something. And it could be a critical piece of information. They will not share that with you if they don't feel safe and they don't feel valued by you. It doesn't happen all the time, but in a majority of instances, in any threat assessment, anything that I've come into contact with, they, students understand the world that we live in and they are reporting the information. They exist on social media, I have two boys. You know, like Officer Priscilla said, they won't get off social media, but they see nuggets of information. And what I would say to you as parents is that those things come to us, we live in an information world, they come to us, no if piece of information is too small. And you know, we ask parents to do it, we ask kids to do it, see something, say something. And I will tell you, in every instance I've ever investigated, I'm proud of the kids that come forward, I'm proud of the parents that come forward, and there might be some bit of truth that we, we, we really don't stop until we turn over, turn over every, every stone. And I say that as a district employee, but we are working in concert with all of our first responders and our law enforcement. It's a very uh, symbiotic relationship um, because they know things that we don't know and they have different training than we do as school, as a, school administrators. Um, and Ms. Powers, uh, excuse me, Superintendent Powers mentioned our school resource officer and our security liaisons, invaluable. Our security liaisons are coaches in the building. Uh, they probably know more kids uh, throughout the years than anyone. And again, that's a piece where they're not just here to, you, know, you hear the word security, they're not here to bust kids and yell at them and make sure they, but they're talking to them, hey, you know, they're developing those relationships. Coach Smoke, Coach Bird, and we're hiring more. And I think that that is uh, key to speak to the after school uh, piece because that is something that's typically not really secure. Um, I think that's something that we just have to think about. Our school resource officer, Officer Priscilla, you can tell um, how passionate he is. Uh, I love the fact that uh, two of his kids have come through and uh, his, his son is a, you know, an upperclassman now. Um, and he's part of this community and you can tell how much he cares about it. And he develops relationships with students all the time and he's such a valuable member of our team. The Safe School Hotline is something that we mentioned. Um, it is an anonymous tip line. Uh, Dr. Walker will probably talk about it as well. Um, there are pieces of information that come into the Safe School Hotline, um, and we investigate every single one, uh, every single piece of information, and we, again, turn over every stone until we can verify that information is either true or that it's false. Um, and some of those situations come in uh, in the middle of the night, um, and what, you know, that's just kind of the world that we live in now. Um, but at, at 2 a.m., if somebody makes a report to the Safe Schools hotline, my phone is ringing, and, you know, and it's not just me. It'll go down the line until someone on our administrative team picks up, uh, and then we communicate internally uh, to ensure that that is going to be addressed. Sometimes those are late night, midnight, 1 o'clock, 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock calls to the TPD. Uh, could be, um, you know, the jurisdiction, our sheriff's department, those types of things. But those are things that occur behind the scene, and I don't you know, really want to go into that uh, too much, but it's just part of the 24-7 the world of information we live in. And again, um, we investigate all of those fully. Uh, it says weekly security briefing. I would say it depends on the situation. Um, you know, after the weekend, Officer Purcell and I will always touch base, um, see if there's anything happening in the community, any things we need to be aware of. Uh, and we also meet as an administrative team and security team uh, once a week. Um, so again, I have the after the weekend check and then we meet as an administrative team, and we, those things might, uh, we might talk about, um, you know, the administrative team, door checks and putting people on a schedule. We might talk about a student situation or something like that, an elevated concern that a parent has brought to us. But again, I think that those conversations are consistent. Um, and I don't want to just say it's twice a week, if there's a need, three times, four times. But um, we are constantly communicating. Um, Next slide, please. Uh, I think that this is huge. Um, the principal's advisory group this year will have a focus on safety and security. If you want to ask students, um, ask them what makes them feel safe at school. Go home and I think ask your child. Um, I've asked mine, um, you know, and, and I think uh, feedback after this is invaluable. Um, and some of the answers may surprise you, some may not. Some may be very, you know, rote uh, answers, but it is very important that um, my principal's advisory group and throughout the district, we're engaging our kids to say, what makes you feel safe at school? What makes you feel unsafe uh, is, is you know, the counter to that. And kids will give you very honest answers. They will. 
Um, and so it's our job to take that feedback. And I would also say, you know, to, to the credit of our district, the surveys that you, you will fill out are equally as important because we can't discount anything. We can't discount the way our, our students are feeling. And I, I specifically understand the way that the kids, uh, I would say, digested Tuesday and Thursday. I understand that um, as a parent, and I take that very seriously. Um, you know, we tell students to see something, say something. I do remind students that are beginning of year class meetings that in a majority of um, mass casualty events that have either occurred in schools or movie theaters in the nation, uh, that someone knew something at some point in time. Uh, that was probably, could have been on social media, could have been on text or something like that. So we just remind our students to see something, say something. I think kids are actually very good at it. Um, you know, uh, we probably get more information than we ever bargained for in this line of work. Uh, but our kids come down and they tell us a lot of things and it's very important. Uh, we did uh, and are in the process this week of issuing students photo identification cards uh, to even increase our, our level of safety and security in the building. Um, and that would be in the event that someone didn't recognize a student um, and say, you know, great, uh, show me your ID. Uh, and so all of our students grades nine through 12 will have those uh, IDs. Um, and I think that that's an extra layer of uh, safety and security. And it's something that we're doing out of an abundance of caution and we'll continue to grow through that process. I've already received some questions from parents after the Blackboard Connect today, um, just about, you know, is it tied to something? Our holes for the, the ID cards. We're starting with the ID cards um, and we expect our students to have those on their person. Um, and I think it's just, again, another layer. Next slide, please. Gotcha. So, go quickly there. Um, you know, and we, uh, some lessons learned from both Tuesday and Thursday. Tuesday was kind of, again, it was not as elevated, uh, I believe. Um, but we also got some really good feedback uh, from both our teaching staff, our students. Um, one thing that we've continued to harp on in every school building I've done, I've been in in my entire career, we harp on accurate attendance. But uh, now we're at the point where that has to be part of the process. And it is in a majority of cases. Um, but in the event that a student is not where they're supposed to be, and in an elevated situation, you, you can understand as both a parent uh, and both a staff member trying to ascertain even more valid information, that if kids aren't where they're supposed to be, that's an issue. Um, so we are really harping on that. Um, something that we've done here at Twinsburg High School, which has been new, um, but some of the feedback from last year was that if a kid was in A-pod, um, and why were they going to the bathroom in the L-pod? You know what I mean? They're going for a little bit of a stroll. Um, so I think that's something that we've learned is we've color-coded those lanyards so kids are even more secure and we can understand that that's a visual reminder. The kids are where they're supposed to be. Uh, and again, it is not, the like Officer for said, it is not a prison. We want to make this place safe, secure, where kids are fun and they're having fun and they're learning. But those are the types of things and the concerns that we can never, any suggestion is a good suggestion. So we took that and it's been very good uh, helping kids be where they need to be. Um, one of the lessons that we learned is some of the feedback I got from parents is that we had students in the rec center in a, a physical education class. They could not hear the PA announcements. Um, and that caused some, uh, you know, uh, really high anxiety uh, for parents, for kids, uh, even for the rec center. So we're working with, you know, Mr. Strickland, and he's going to talk. Um, but we audited, really, our entire PA system, uh, whether it was low level, whether it was high level, or whether people just couldn't hear it. Um, you know, in instances of those types of things, you're trying to get as much information to the students, to the staff as possible. Um, so we've audited that. Um, and also, that kind of speaks to the idea, and we've all spoken about this. In a school, uh, you're never probably going to practice your drills at an extreme time. If you just think about it in terms of logistics, you're moving 13 to 1400 kids you're probably gonna say, let's practice a drill during first period where everybody's in their you know, classrooms, nice and easy, those types of things. Well, both of these scenarios took place kind of during Tuesday, Thursday, and actually the water main break, uh, but occurred during uh, lunchtime, specifically Thursday, which was a little bit more elevated. Um, so we learned from Tuesday that we have to address moving large groups of students, i.e. the lunchroom, to a secure location. Uh, and it's something that we addressed quickly. Uh, we rekeyed doors, and I would say that we learned from Tuesday is that when Thursday happened, we got the kids out of the cafeteria, and again, not 
perfectly, but it was quick because we had already addressed it. We had accurate feedback, and so we were even getting better on Thursday. Um, so that is just, again, some of the feedback that came back. Um, and then, of course, we have to manage those students. We're moving 500 kids in here. There's elevated concerns. There's anxiety um, and those types of things. So we have to be able to manage large uh, groups of, of students. Um, next slide. So, the, uh, and I think this is my last slide, but the need for up-to-date information in student files, a very important, um, what I would say to, to every parent here, to all students, is that that's very uh, important information. You don't know in the time, you're, you're trying to ascertain the most accurate information possible, whether that is coming from a staff member, a student, a parent. And so there are times where we need to verify information. Um, and so, I, to Officer Purcell's point, you never want to slow down. You want to move quickly and accurately through the information. So if there's a wrong phone number, it could um, cause you a delay. Or if there's a wrong email address or something like that. So we ask that our parents kind of, up, not kind of, but place the most up-to-date information in students', students files. Um, one thing that is relevant, and I don't discount this at all, and it's a part of the world that we live in, is managing misinformation spread by texting and social media. Um, I did hear from some parents, my student was unable to access their phone, I wanted to know they're safe. Um, I agree with that, I'm a parent too, um, I would just want to know my, my son was safe, right? Um, so we're addressing that with the staff, I think there's a best practice there um, that we need to find. Um, you know, some of the teachers said, well, we're holding place, so we're teaching. And not to get into too specifics, but as a parent, that is what the parent wants, to know that their kid is safe, um, their student is safe. To, to Superintendent Powers point, we send out accurate, verified information when we were able to do so. Uh, I'm proud of the team. I'm proud of the fact that we moved through that. Um, what that looks like is 100%, 150% of our district resources, manpower, computer resources, law enforcement, first responders, is dedicated to your child safety. Nothing else matters at that point in time. So if something comes in to this building, which is an elevated concern, everything stops and everything is dedicated to your child's safety, child and staff safety, the building, uh, of course, as well. But So we, we, we do that, uh, we do as best as we can, um, and there are always going to be, there are going to be text messages. I understand that, I also don't discount um, the images that students have seen on the news, and I, I understand um, that when they see, you know, an elevated police presence in the building, um, however, kind of said it earlier, but, um, if I have to go to my grave and I have to say that's what I did, well, I will always err on the side of caution. And that's just me personally, um, and that's not, that's a, not a knee-jerk reaction. It's in concert with a lot of information, um, but it's something that, that I just feel uh, strongly about um, and that we can never have, uh, we can never be too safe, let's put it that way. Um, and then the last thing is the reunification protocols. Um, I told somebody, uh, I appreciate the parents, if anybody was in the crowd, Mr. Strickland and the entire staff, uh, for you know, waiting patiently for their children. I did tell somebody I thought about it through the lens of my wife, and I would say, look out if my wife ever comes to that building, because I get it, you know, it's that, that visceral moment where a parent wants to reunify with their child. Um, and we're gonna have ongoing uh, uh, you know, uh, conversations about that, how we can do it accurately, how we can do it quickly, but the thing is, is we have to do it safely. Um, so I think that those are some of the things that are lessons learned. Um, Again, I appreciate you all for taking the time to listen to me. Um, and I do think that if you are here and you're talking about safety and security, um, we are doing it in a transparent way possible and we can learn from you. Um, and so whatever we can do as a school, um, we can take your suggestions and, and move forward uh, from there. So thank you. And at this time, I'll have a Thank you, Mr. Lynn. Um, I just want to thank Mr. Lynn. Uh, since the first day of school here at the high school, he has been in an elevated state of anxiety. You can't stay there for very long. It is, it is all he was dealing with was making sure that this campus was safe and the kids were safe and the staff was safe. And so I want to thank Ryan and his entire administrative team. They did a great job. Uh, since the water main break happened and the two holes in place, Thank you very much for your leadership. The entire team did an outstanding job. We appreciate you. Uh, we're very 
fortunate um, that Mr. Matt Strickland has joined our staff this year as our business manager. Um, Matt comes to us with a lot of experience in crisis planning. Uh, it was one of the things that we were most interested in uh, when we were looking at his candidacy um, to, to fill the open spot this past summer. So Matt would like to talk to you a little bit of, deeper about ramification and some other lessons that we learned um, through the events of last week. Matt Strickland. Superintendent Powers. I'm like Officer Priscilla. I'm a pacer, mover, and a shaker, so stay with me. Um, thank you all for being here. I wish we could have met under better circumstances, but this is how it has to happen. Um, I want to tell you that by now you've heard about technology, cameras, SROs, security liaisons, protocol, crisis management, um, compliance pieces with the state of Ohio to make sure we're safe. Uh, security blueprints, we've talked about all these things, um, but I'll tell you when, you, when it brings you to this meeting tonight, I love that we're here because I love um, Superintendent Powers and our school board's transparency, and they want this to be a dialogue, a conversation, a relationship. It's not a one-way street. Um, it's not a, you, you trust your kid with us all day, we keep them safe, you don't need to know what goes on while they're here. That's not what this is. Um, you do have a right to know what your kids are doing there when they're here, and you have a right to know our investment in their safety as well. Um, crisis management, we submit all sorts of plans to the state of Ohio every year, from security blueprints of our buildings, so um, that's for first responders, um, to written plans that talk about roles and responsibilities in any kind of crisis, whether it's a natural disaster, whether it's an attack, um, terrorist attack, chemical, anything, you name it. We have a plan for it. But when you come here as a parent, maybe you came here tonight angry, upset, questioning, happy. Um, you were satisfied with our response um, to the things last week. However you came in here tonight, what I want you to leave with are all the scenarios that we do plan for, but like so many school districts or organizations, churches, hospitals, we say safety is the number one priority, and that's the mission statement, right? Yeah, great. What does that mean, though? What does that mean in action and in practice, and how can you trust your child with us during the school day? How do you trust uh, your child with us at a football game with a few thousand people? Is safety the number one priority then, and what does that look like in action? So when we submit these crisis management plans, they have incident command roles. And that's something that we saw play out in real time on Thursday, primarily, last week. Who's in charge? Who's doing what? Who's communicating what? Who's talking and interfacing with the school board? Who's talking to the news? Who's talking to social media? Who's monitoring what parents are having to say? The police come in, it's one thing, well, police are in charge, they're on the scene, and that's true. In a crisis like what we thought we had Thursday, the police are in charge, but then we all play another role. We learned a lot, as Brian said, we learned a lot about our incident command roles, and we're looking at that. Um, we have a security liaison um, with Ohio Department of Education. He's retired Ohio Homeland Security, and we're blessed to have him. His name's Tim Del Vecchio. And we have a meeting next week with him to talk about our incident command roles. We're going to peel this thing apart, what went on. We're going to talk about what we feel like we did pretty well and where we feel like, ah, we don't, we don't feel so great about that. In the event of something, the real deal, we could have done better. Um, one of those pieces is the reunification piece. Um, what is reunification? When I, before I got into this role, I could tell you sort of textbook what the word meant but not in practice when it comes to reunifying kids or staff with loved ones. Don't forget about the staff piece. You got hundreds of people working in a building that are freaked out. They are traumatized because they think the worst has happened. So like your child, we've got a staff full of people that had a very real trauma. Reunification is how do we safely connect them back with their people at home so everybody's not quite as freaked out, right? Um, sometimes, an event, sometimes the stampede that can happen after the event can do as much damage as the event. If you get an angry mob of people, I'm a parent too. I'm with you. Uh, whatever parent met me out of the parking lot last Thursday, toe to toe with me. I don't really care who you are, Mr. Strickland, I'm getting in that building, I'm getting my kid. 
You know, they told me this on the phone. I believe this to be true. I'm getting in there. That's a hard conversation to have because guess what? Mom and dad, parent at home, I'm with you. I'm arms, I'm in arms with you. I, I want my kid. When we talk reunification, here's the most ironic, strangest thing you've ever heard. Superintendent Powers and I, an hour earlier than this, we weren't out for coffee. We weren't having a team meeting. We weren't talking about pie in the sky ideas about how to do great things for the Twinsburg community. You know where we were? Off site at the rack in Reminderville, planning for reunification for the October 5th drill. We, we've talked about this many times now. Some of the notes I took at that site, we went and practiced it and had no idea that was about to happen. We went and did it live right here at our own high school. Some of the very notes I wrote down, questions, you're walking the property, where are parents gonna park? How do we crowd control? How do we keep people calm? How do we take care of the kids that are in our care? How do we reunify safely? Police, fire, what are they doing? Um, our district administrators, our principals, our central office staff, what are they doing? Are they, are they hiding in a building or are they out? No, they're here helping us. We're talking about all these rule, roles and within about 45 minutes our phones are going off. Here we are at the high school, we are about to live this thing in real time. So, we learned a lot of good lessons, that's all great. I will tell you, um, we are working hard in the interview. Superintendent Power said, talk to me about your views on safety. Boy, that was, a, that was like a prelude to a, a pretty wild first week of school here. But I'll tell you, there's nowhere else I'd rather be. Um, when we talk reunification, we, that will be a conversation with all of you as a, as a community about what your role as parent and guardian is in reunification. How do we keep each other calm and work together because you got to know our goal is to keep your kids safe and to get them back with you. We're not your enemy. We don't want to serve as a barrier or say, no, you can't have your child. We want you to have them back. We want them, but there's a safe way to do that because please keep in mind, when you go through all this crisis training, you have to think like someone that wants to do harm. So when people are showing up by the dozens to get their kid, maybe one adult out of the mass does not mean well for the school. Maybe they're part of the problem. We have to look at it that way, so we have to one by one reunify kids with their adults. Does that make sense? So please be patient with us. If you showed up here Thursday, you did a great job. Our parking was wonky. It was a little like a zoo. I apologize. We'll get it right the next time around. I hope we don't have it next time. But, it, but we're going to practice it. We're going to talk with police and fire. We're going to talk about how do we demarcate our parking lot to make it better for you, safer for you. How do we de-escalate the craziness you're already feeling that we totally get because we're feeling it too. Okay. The last thing I really want to close with, um, your kids are in good hands. All of the stuff I just talked about, all the plans, what do we know? Your best, best laid plans, right? Some of it goes out the window in emergency. Fight or flight kicks in. People's human nature kicks in. You're going to do what you're going to do, and you're not going to do what you're not going to do. Some people might run and hide when they were trained to, train to stand and fight or whatever, all those uh, dynamics. But let me tell you what I saw Thursday. We walk in. We get here, I'd say, mid-stride of this whole thing. By now, however you came in here tonight, I'm sure Uvalde's probably on your mind. You heard that um, the administration at the school, the school level, they had some fails, some real gaps. Police department, you've heard the same thing. It's a, as a taxpayer, you're going, man, they were failed. That community was failed by the school, by the people that were paid to what, protect them. You know what I saw when I walked in this building? I jumped right in with Brian and his team we're shoulder to shoulder. We're, we're coming through this building with the police. We're finding out what's happening. Because you know what, what went on in Texas? What happened here Thursday? And your administration was responsible for that. So any question you have, ask it. Let your voice be heard. That's all great. We're all about feedback. But I want you to know what you can't capture in a crisis plan and what you can't capture in all these uh, pieces about compliance and all this. The heart of people and the leaders that you have in this school district would stand in front of anything for your child, and they proved it Thursday. Absolutely proved it Thursday. So thank you all. Look forward to hearing from you soon. With that, I'll turn it back over to the superintendent. Thank you.
Matt and I a warm, safe, and dry guy. He takes care of our facilities, makes sure the kids are warm, safe, and dry, HVAC, school security, and all that. Well, we want to switch gears a little bit and talk about the heart of the student and the heart of our staff and the hearts of our parents. And we're, we're just so um, proud of the fact that Dr. Andrea Walker is our Director of Student Wellness. When Thursday happened, Dr. Walker was here with me and she was very concerned about not the incident as it was happening, but what we were going to do after the incident and how we were going to address the students, the staff, and how we're communicating with parents. And so she has a few tips to share with you this evening. Without further ado, Dr. Andre Walker. So good evening, everyone. Um, as Mrs. Power stated, I have to think about all the things that happen afterward. And all of your emotions, my emotions, all of our kids, all of their emotions, because as everyone has stated, there's so many things that are in the forefront of our mind due to everything that we're seeing on TV, it's hard to remain calm in these types of situations. So um, one of the things that I want you to recognize is that I have to talk about something that typically has not been talked about or maybe not necessarily um, an open conversation, and that's talking about mental health. And I think the pandemic has opened up the doors a lot more, but it's still sometimes a taboo situation to talk about because many of us have been taught to keep things inside our house, especially if people are struggling with certain things. And what we're learning is that the more that we talk to other people, and we tell this to our students, if you ask a question, nine times out of 10, there's somebody in the classroom who still doesn't understand the answer or doesn't know how you got to the solution. And what we're learning about emotions is that nine times out of 10, if you felt a certain way, at some point in, some, in someone else's life, they may have felt that same way too. And that gives assurance and also builds uh, resilience in how to get through situations. So we recognize that the mental health of our students and our families experience stress on that day, they experience anxiety on that day, and experience fear, if, if I'm being honest. And I'm a parent, um, I think all of us have kind of talked about it, but my daughter also attends the school district. I'm a graduate of the school district. And when I was here uh, many moons ago, the big thing was bomb threats. That was the big thing. And we all had to go to the gym while the police did their business. So the Twinsburg Police Department, many, many, many years ago, has been doing the same things that they've been doing now, and that is providing a safe and secure atmosphere for our students. And I'm not saying that that's a good thing, but things happen. We're, we're not exempt from things happening, but we are being as prepared as possible in the instance that we may have a bad day here. So when my daughter comes home from school, one of the first things I ask her is, how's your day? Many of you ask your child, how was your day? Probably before, how was math? Or how was that test? Because we care about how their day was. And either, whether we can tell that by the way they're jumping in the house and happy, or the way they may come in the house with shoulders hunched, we care about how our children's day went. And I'm the exact same way. And so as parents, I realize, and we realize this more as adults, how important it is to preserve our children's childhood. We want it full of happy memories, right? We want it full of good days, and we want to eliminate as many bad days as possible because we recognize that that is the foundation in which we're going to be great adults. And so for that, um, I know that it's my responsibility as well, as all the other staff members have discussed, that it's my responsibility to help with um, safety. But a part of my job is to take care of those invisible things, or sometimes they're visible things and in terms of feelings, and in terms of the culture of a building. Like when you go in, does it look like a happy place? Have you ever walked into a place and you're like, ooh, Okay, we don't want you to say Ugh, when you walk into the schools. We want our kids to feel welcome. We want you to see color, we want you to see light. And that is very purposeful in driving the culture of a building and making sure that you have happy feelings and preserving those good childhood moments. And so what I want, what I want you to learn tonight from me, what I'm talking about when it comes to mental health, every time you come, uh, your children come home, we want your children to say, mom, dad, grandma, Aunt, uncle, I had a good day at school. And from that, we want to build upon good days to even better days. 
And that's all we kind of really want because the rest of it can be worked out, right? But we want to prepare and have good days at school. But in the, in the instance that we can't control certain factors, we want you as parents to also feel good that we can come back around and create better days because some things think, sometimes things happen. So we recognize on the next day that um, some of the lessons that the teachers planned were pretty much diminished. They really didn't matter in the face of what took place the day before. And so although, although it's kind of good, like come back to school, learn about math, science, social studies, whatever, we had to learn that our students may have been physically, mentally, or emotionally just overwhelmed. Many of them may have been coming to school reluctantly. Many of you may have sent your children to school reluctantly, but you sent them to school because there had to be some form of trust. And we really take that seriously that you sent your children back to school the next day because you easily could not have. And we had a lot of parents who trusted us the way we handled the situation and the care that you believed your children were going to receive, which what we intended to do was have all of our children um, because they're all teenagers, we know they're, you know, it's fun times being a teenager, right? And it's fun times being a parent of a teenager. I'm preteen, so I'm, I'm getting there with you guys. But what happens is their bodies and their minds are just very sensitive to stress, as we all know, right? Clean up your room, you know? Okay, so it becomes more when it's a real deal situation. And because their bodies are so sensitive to stress, we have to make sure that we are recognizing that and we're not just jumping back into academics. And so with that said, um, if you can go to slide two, I'm sorry. I asked the educators to create a space and time outside of their curriculum just to kind of have a conversation with the students. And it's very, very similar to what we're doing here today. We're taking the time to discuss what happened. We're taking the time to take questions and have an open dialogue because what we call that is a restorative practice. And sometimes like these words that you may hear, you're like, what does that mean? A restorative practice essentially is restoring what may have been lost or what may have been harmed in an incident. And for some of our students, for some of our families, even some of our staff members, the feeling of safety may have been lost on that day, right? The feeling of trust may have been lost on that day. But the way that you bring that back, the way that you restore that to have good days and better days is to have a conversation. And we talked about how relationships really matter. Relationships matter because they bridge the, the way to trust and they bridge the way to understanding, which helps to build trust. And so what we're doing is we had um, our teachers and our students talk openly. I'll be honest, I went into a couple of classrooms and I talked to students and just wanted to know how they're feeling. And I came back with some really, really good feedback from a kid's perspective. Because oftentimes as adults, we think we know what to do. But they also have some really good ideas. And I took some of that information back and shared it with the administrative team because it's a, it's a 360 view of the situation. I'm not saying that they have full and total control, but some of the things they came up with made sense to how they were feeling and how we could make them feel supported in, this, in the uh, in the situation. So we try to embody a reflective stance, reflective stance as you see today. We're reflecting and we reflected with the students and we're hopeful that by reflecting and putting into action some of the thoughts that, and feedback that we get back that we can have um, a, a good time, uh, a better time, and a, a best time here in our, in our school district. So um, for students who um, may have struggled when we were talking and these and having these conversations with students, we are still providing ongoing support. I want you to know that your students have the ability to not only reach out to their principals, but their school counselors, and also we have a community partnership with Beachbrook. There are social workers and they're trained to help with more um, elevated crisis situations. So if you have a child that's still struggling or if you know of a, of a like a neighbor or somebody who might who said, hey, my, my kid's just a little, little unshaken, just have them come to um, principal. They can even email me and we'll get them connected to the right person so that they can continue to feel um, supported. So many of us have discussed, if you see something, say something. And we've discussed the Safe School Hotline. 
And I know that we're live streaming this, so I'm going to be very deliberate about my information tonight so that um, you can even write this down. Our Safe School Hotline is essentially see something, say something. As we have discussed, any time incidents happen here in school, it's typically that someone has known something previous to the event, and if you say something, it usually can um, eliminate more harm. So our Safe School Hotline, um, if you don't write it down, it is on our website, it is on every single footer, so on web, on, I don't care what you click on, athletics, if you click on the, the, you know, the cafeteria menus, it is on the bottom of our um, website so you can get the information there. It is also plastered in all of our schools, um, there's posters, and for the younger kids we send home pamphlets. Um, you may have received one as well, but those pamphlets help just kind of tell you what it's all about. But our Safe School Hotline number, if you call it, you can call it from any telephone, cell phone. It's 800-418-6423, and that's extension 359. And you can leave any information that you would like. And because of the technology and the day and age that we live in, students can text information and parents can text information. This is not just for students, this is for parents as well. Um, and you can text at 2614. 426-0240 and just put the word tips in the text message and they will correspond with you via text. A lot of people are saying, well, I don't want to call, I don't want to be the snitch. Well, for what it's worth, it is a confidential call and your everything remains anonymous and they do not trace your numbers. The reason they do that is they want to encourage people to if they see something, say something, and that they are remain that they can remain confidential and anonymous. So I just want you to remember that. And then my last thing that I'd like to discuss is our um, 988 number. This is a little bit of a heavier topic, and I um, don't necessarily like to end on it, but I would like to mention it. We have noticed an increase in mental health crisis throughout the United States, um, and as such, we've had parents who've had some struggles students who've had some struggles, and then family members who've had some struggles. And due to that, we have also added on the bottom of our footer the, the number 988. Similar to 911, 988 is an emergency number that you can call from any phone, and it will get you connected to a trained mental health a professional 24-7, 365 days out of the year to support um, you or a family member, and it can direct you to the right place if you're having a medical emergency or not. And it doesn't matter if you're in Ohio, you can be in Alaska, you can be in California, it does not matter. You can call 988, it gives you, um, and, and it's like a universal entryway, and it will get you the support that you need and get you connected to the right professionals. So um, you can also text and chat with them at 988lifeline.org, but it probably is easier to call because I, I just can't imagine if you're going through a crisis that you might want to, you might want to talk on the phone so they can have better help remedy the situation. So again, um, we really appreciate having this conversation and this dialogue with you tonight. And above everything, we hope that um, we create nothing more but good and better days for your children. Thank you. We are very fortunate that Dr. Walker works in our district. She really keeps the heart and soul of students front and center and reminds us of the importance of managing mental health, making sure kids are comfortable in, the, in, um, in our schools. And also she provides that kind of support to our staff members too. So thank you, Walker, for being here this night and providing uh, your information. Um, she talked a little bit about the, the information on the slides, so I'm not gonna be redundant, but again, we do encourage parents um, if your child comes home and says they, they heard something in the locker room, they heard something in the commons, please pick up the phone and, and report that. No matter how small the incident might seem to you, um, it can make a huge difference in the lives of, of kids on our campuses. So please, we offer that service to you to um, call. It is 100% anonymous. We never know where the calls come from. I can tell you the other evening, I think it was Friday night, um, I received a call, I was at the board office, and the gentleman on the line said, okay, I've called five other administrators, you're the first one to pick up. And they do that, they call until they get a live voice, and then they offered me the advice to go on the website, on my email, and get more information. 
So they're very diligent and deliberate in connecting with us. And that was a call done to Mr. Lynn, and we were off to the races with an investigation. So no matter what time of day or night, that service is available to anyone, and we encourage you to take advantage of that and, and your child as well. So just a few more slides here. Um, Brian and um, Matt talked a little bit about emergency management plans. Uh, those are authorized by Chief Mason and Chief Morgan and then submitted to the Attorney General's office. Very confidential in nature, but the, the blessing of having our law enforcement and fire department take a look at it is because they see things through the lens of their particular positions in our community. Um, true statement, when we were looking at our plans last June, Chief Morgan noticed that in some of our floor plans we did not have the locations of fire extinguishers noted. That's important in an emergency. And so because he was able to key in on that, we said, oh yeah, they're not there. Don't know how that wasn't there. We added them and uh, were able to submit the plans with his uh, approval with regards to anything in the area of fire safety. So we thank our continued partnership with the, the, the men and ladies across the street. Um, Mr. Lynn talked about uh, Student Advisory Council. Each of our school principals have Student Advisory Councils. We believe in voice and choice here for our students. Um, Ms. Villa has a little bit of a different circumstance. She cannot start her Student Advisory Council until the kids learn how to do school. Um, but uh, pretty soon, um, into the months of January and February, Ms. Villa will also have a, a Student Advisory Council. And the little ones have great opinions about things. I sat in on one of the meetings, the kids were talking about playground safety. And their perspectives was one that we wouldn't normally see looking at it through an adult lens. And so engaging the kids in those kinds of conversations, no matter the age, is very important. Um, you might have heard there was a media release a couple weeks back that the school, our school district was fortunate. Each of our schools are recipients of a security grant. Um, Governor DeWine was very proud to announce that. Uh, we have the intention of moving forward with the submission that is under the office of Mr. Strickland, our business department. We will be looking to purchase additional radios, additional cameras, other things that are directly related to school safety. Uh, the second thing that we're going to do beyond the submission of those grants, those grants are pretty much an automatic. We know we received those dollars, we just have to submit what we're going to spend those dollars on. The second thing is more competitive, that's another OFCC grant, again, for school safety. So as soon as Mr. Strickland clears the hurdle of submitting our requests for those dollars for the school safety grant from Governor DeWine, the next step then is to submit our next OFCC grant with additional um, asks for funding for additional school safety protocols, equipment, and the matter. So that work continues behind the scenes. Uh, we've talked a lot about challenges this evening. We've talked about mental health and we've talked about social media and phones. Our kids today see so many more things than we did when we were their age. They get information immediately, unfiltered, and some of our students are not in the age or the developmental stage to be able to comprehend what they're even seeing. So we just respectfully request that, you know, continue to monitor your child's use of social media, what they're seeing on the internet, what they watch in the media in general. Some of it is pretty rough. Um, looking at the video from Uvalde as an adult, that really struck me. I can imagine seeing that as a child. And so those things are challenges for us. Peer relationships are important and they matter. Everyone who spoke tonight talked about the importance of building relationships with our students and between students and staff members, and we don't take that lightly. And then finally, societal situations impact our schools. Those safe school tip line, helpline calls, they impact the schools. What kids see in the media impacts the schools. What kids see on TikTok. You know, last year we had struggles here at the high school with kids copycatting what they saw on TikTok. And so we continue to evolve as a school district, being responsive to what students bring with them every day here on our campuses. Is it 100% fail safe? I can tell you it's not, because as things introduce themselves, we have to have an internal process of auditing. What are we doing? How do we respond? How do we encourage kids to help be a part of the problem solving process? How do we engage our parents? And so it's a work in progress, but I think the staff here really has the intention of supporting students as, to the highest degree as possible, keeping these relationships um, at the forefront and making sure that we're in communication with our families as well. So considerations, um, thank you to the over 350 parents who have 
have submitted um, responses to my online survey. If you missed it yesterday, a Blackboard Connect message went out. A uh, survey will be open until next, um, uh, next Monday. Um, I apologize if we're not including that survey data here tonight. It would be premature. But some of the things that um, have come up in uh, the survey data were considerations for things such as metal detectors and wands. Um, is Twinsburg a community that would support that kind of um, protocol? I don't know. And I know that um, at this point, our Board of Education has asked me to investigate what would those things look like? How much do they cost? What kind of staff members would be needed to support them? Is Twinsburg City School District a place where those would be well received? And so we'll continue to look through um, those things and provide a report to the Board of Education as we move into the future talking about school safety. Uh, we've um, had um, some folks on the survey talk about bulletproof, hurricane resistant um, glass. Um, should we invest in, in the, that kind of um, uh, glass structure for our buildings? Don't know the answer to that. It's something that we'll be looking into. Uh, we've already talked about police officers stationed at each of our schools, and I'm very grateful to the Twinburg Police Department for moving that conversation forward with their department. We hope to have additional SROs here shortly. Everything's a process, and everybody has to work through their own processes within their departments to make those things work. So just know that that is in the works. And then there are other options to consider. So this is a work in progress, um, but we're open to um, talking through all of that with our constituents, our stakeholders, and our, and our kids to make sure that we're the very safest that we can be. Um, some of the things that we have to worry about here in the short term, given what we've learned over the last week, our public address systems, although they're new in all of our schools, it failed us last week here at the high school because it didn't extend next door to the fitness center. Um, I can tell you on Tuesday of last week when we had the misidentified student, my cafeteria staff from the direction of Mark Bendis did not know we had a crisis. The ladies kept making salads while all this other stuff was going on. So we have to be paying attention to those kinds of things, making sure that when we say we have a PA system that reaches everyone, that it actually does. And so that pushed us out to make sure that we audit it, now we know where the issues are, and the staff is working behind the scenes to rectify that. Um, locking systems, you know, um, sometimes it's human error. Sometimes the teacher thinks I'm only gonna go out that door for five minutes, gonna go get something out of my trunk and come back. In five minutes' time, we can have a tragedy on our hands. And so it's really reminding the staff that they need to be sure they're not going to cause an error to happen. You just think it's only five minutes, but in five minutes' time, something horrific can happen. And so we're, we continue to address this with our staff and really helping them to take ownership in what part they play in school safety. Um, we have to revisit our fences at the elementary schools. Not feeling very comfortable looking at the um, playgrounds past week at all three of our, our campuses. We need to do something about that. Not quite sure what the answer is at this point. But I feel that that is a safety hazard that um, we need to address. So that is something that is on our short list. The security liaisons will help. Um, one of the uh, comments in the card was, well, what about if my kid's not an athlete? What about for concerts and, and, and the like? The security liaisons will be assigned to the activities where they are, no matter what they are. So if I um, <coughs> Um, upset anyone I didn't mean to do that tonight. It's not just meant for the athletic activities. We have a lot of concerts. This place has happened all winter. Um, we have wonderfully talented kids, TVMB, the boosters support our, our show choirs. We have orchestra, we have band, we have kids moving in and out and all about drama club. And so wherever there is an activity, we will be assigning a security liaison to make sure that the campus is safe for those activities wherever they're happening to be taking place. Um, and of course, we need to continue to revisit our communications. Is it fit, fail safe? No. Do we need to improve it? Absolutely. I can tell you though, on Thursday, before I hit send on that Redboard Connect message, uh, Chief Mason was in Mr. Lynn's office with me. I said, Tom, can you look at this message? Does it say what it needs to say? So we have a system of checks and balances because I am not going to send a message out to my parents that the chief of police is going to say, misinformation, inaccurate, too much information, not factual. He looked at my message, said it's fine, I hit send. 
So it's a process that we work through, and it takes a few minutes, and I apologize because you want information, um, but we have to do it the right way, and it just takes a, a few minutes to get it done. So um, thank you to the parents and um, visitors tonight for um, submitting some questions. At this time, we're going to go through some of these questions, hopefully answer the questions for you. Um, Matt and Ryan and Andrea have some questions for all of us, so if you want to come forward, because I might be answering some of these questions. And the first one is from Matt Strickland because it talks about our Ohio Schools grant. Um, in specifics, um, the parent would like to know what the school district will be spending the grant money on, um, how did we apply, when will we apply, and uh, when can we expect the equipment that will be purchased with the grant. Sure. Yeah, so um, the, the money that we got from Governor DeWine that was announced a few weeks back, um, that those figures were based on a grant that my predecessor Chad had applied for last fall. Um, so that was for um, upgraded exterior cameras. So a lot of parking lot and exterior door facing cameras. Um, also handheld radios. Those are really huge in our world um, because those cut through. If your PA system does go on the fritz. Um, or if you've got a dead zone in the building where you can't hear, or whatever it is, handheld radios cut through all that. So that grant was largely those couple of things, radios, cameras. Um, the new OFCC grant, we will be looking at some different things. Our school board is evaluating some items they might be interested in, but a lot of it we're hoping will come from the feedback from tonight. Um, the survey that Superintendent Powers put out, uh, we've seen some ideas that we haven't really had any conversation about that have come from you as the adults at home. So um, we're evaluating that. I would imagine, though, we'll look at even more cameras um, and then potentially some other uh, safety devices. Um, I'd love to look at some things that are a little bit more portable safety uh, to make our stadium safer, our fields and our athletic facilities safer. Um, so those kinds of things, uh, those kinds of items are all on the list. Um, as far as when they start to come in, um, we do have to submit to the state what we intend to buy. Um, I would imagine we'll see a lot of those items this school year that we're in. Um, and then the new OFCC grant, um, that funding probably would get announced once we apply. I'd imagine within three months, they're not extraordinarily fast, but still an opportunity to see some of those items in this school year. Thank you. Yep. Uh, the next question goes to um, Brian Lynn, our high school principal. The question talks about the district safety pr protocols regarding students who may bring weapons to school. So if we can talk a little bit about student code of conduct and uh, the reaction to a situation like last Thursday. Sure. So, um, you know, regarding, I guess, any allegation or any rumor that a student would bring a weapon to school, um, it would be an immediate, um, you know, conference with our school resource officer. Of course, we involve law enforcement at the earliest possible uh, stage because of that. Um, and the first thing is, is to secure the threat. Um, and, you know, again, that allegation is a threat that the student may have a weapon on campus. Um, so uh, in this, you know, scenario, Thursday scenario, those, those students were secured immediately uh, with help from law enforcement. And we were working in conjunction in terms of administrative team, law enforcement team, um, regarding the student code of conduct, um, there is basically uh, language in our student code of conduct that we take it at the most <coughs> severe, uh, I guess, uh, piece of the puzzle. Uh, students are always offered due process. Uh, but again, kind of back to my earlier point, 150, 200%, all of our resources go to the safety and security of our kids. Um, and then the school disciplinary actions uh, take place you know, after that threat is neutralized. Um, and then. Again, that's all, uh, uh, I guess, a legal process, a due process where the students are offered an opportunity once that threat is, uh, I guess, mitigated. Um, and then we go forward from there with um, some quite severe consequences, not to get into, I guess, that piece of it. Um, and then also, too, there is uh, a lot of language in our code of conduct that would encourage parents, students, uh, we review it with them. Um, students never believe me, um, but I do review these things, our assistant principals uh, review these things, and there are legal consequences for actions. Um, you know, in, in the case of a weapon, in the case of other things, such as harassment. Um, so there's a higher revised code that, that, that governs those things. So again, number one, 
first and foremost, if any allegation, any rumor, it's investigated with law enforcement immediately. Uh, the number one most important thing is to secure the safety of the students in the building. Uh, then that student would be offered due process um, with a range of consequences in terms of a weapon or something that was verified. Uh, extremely severe consequences. Um, and again, that is part of the process where those students are to go through um, multiple hearings. Um, and that's to, you know, that's just part of the process. And then the third, the third tier of that is that there are times uh, when Police report is filed. Uh, it's typically filed by me uh, in conjunction with uh, our school resource officer, Officer Priscilla, um, uh, in, in cases that, that the law is broken. Thank you, Brian. Um, Andre, the question next has to do with mental health crisis. This uh, particular card talks about the mental health crisis tip line, which is 4 Hope to 741 741. But can you just mention beyond this what our referral process is to Beachbrook? If a parent feels that their child has mental health concerns, what, how do they connect themselves? What does that referral process look like? Okay, so first of all, Beachbrook is offered in all of our buildings. Um, they're an extended support beyond our school counselors and our teachers and our principals to provide intensive supports to students who may need them for a variety of reasons. Um, so, first of all, if you have a student or a child, I should say, if your child is experiencing any um, challenges that may be impacting their school, their school life, you want to talk to the principal first. When you speak with the principal, the principal will then talk to you about those specific uh, concerns that you have. And again, that remains confidential. As I talked about earlier, I know sometimes discussing things that are held very sacred uh, and it may be a little bit um, hard to discuss. It may, it may be a challenge, but when you say those things to the principal, they get that information to the right person, and that's our school social workers at, at the various levels. And then we will disseminate that information with a referral, and that referral will depend on um, if they, if, what type of service they may need and the frequency of that service. And what we try to do is have um, students that receive support in school, but the way that Beachbrook works is that they are also able, especially in the summertime, um, they are able to do things outside of the school, like inside of homes, uh, maybe going to the park and, and, and giving their different types of services so that they can support the student year round. So um, if you need or your child needs support in that way, please contact the building principal and then they will direct the referral to the Beachbrook staff to support um, not only your child, but they also help support you as a parent to kind of give you some tips on maybe how you can better manage your child at home. Thank you. Uh, the next uh, couple of cards had to do with metal detector, metal detectors. And um, Matt, I'm gonna give you a question. Um, the questions are, do you think we uh, should consider metal detectors and are there plans for metal? Yeah, so that was um, feedback, again, that we're taking from the community and the board, getting everyone's perception on it. I think um, if you'd asked me that five years ago, I'd say, yeah, most communities in our area would say, no, that's a hard stop. We're not an airport or an institution. I will say times are changing, though. Um, there's good data uh, behind proof of metal detectors. One of them is the perception. Um, if I'm a student, and I'm on the edge of maybe bringing a weapon to school and I know that there's potential that I could get a metal detector wand, maybe that deters me from making a bad decision. Um, so there, that we do it, you can find data that does support that. Um, I think they are cost effective. Um, I think that needs to, however, though, that needs to be a board, staff, community decision collectively saying, this is something we would like our dollars spent on. We wanna be good stewards, um, but we don't, you know, we don't want to knee jerk. I, I think there's good data to support um, it being a proactive approach to school safety. Yeah. So I guess in the order of things, we, as you know, the survey is out, getting lots of great feedback. Many folks are talking about metal detectors and their responses in the survey. Uh, once that information is collected next week, we'll engage the board in a conversation about a direction they would like us to go. I believe we'll probably be back out to the community talking. If that's an area that we'll be pursuing before that is pursued, 
back to our families to say, this is something that we're really considering. What do you think about it? It's also conversations with local law enforcement, county law enforcement, reminder bill, just so that everyone's on the same page moving forward that this is the best option for our school district to consider. So much more to come on that, as well as other things that are identified through the survey. And that's the reason the survey's out there, getting your feedback. Thank you, Matt. Um, this next question talks about parent notification, and I think we've talked a little bit about that. Um, really, it's a process that we follow. Um, is it sit and fail safe? No. Um, whether or not we change processes moving forward, of course, everything's up to conversation and debate. Um, we will continue to look at our, our, our notification processes. How we, how we notify you in a crisis, though, can't be an email. I know that already. Um, but when we notify you, we may need to make some adjustments. Again, I'm very cautious about sending out information about a crisis. I don't normally do that until I've talked to the chief of police. That's just how I operate, because I don't want to cross any lines that they have established for their department either. In a crisis, there's usually a public information officer assigned. So if we were to have a serious situation, a lockdown, an Alice situation, kids fleeing the building, immediately they're off after there is a PIO, from the city that would be working with the school district with me to disseminate information and how that information would get out. So it's very choreographed in how that would work. Um, and some things just uh, cannot be known until we would have such a situation. But just know that this is a work in progress and we continue to work with city services to um, provide the information that you need when you need it. Um, Matt, this is um, a question about reunification. It says, uh, parents rushing to the school demanding their kids, I imagine it's very disruptive to protect them and reunite them. What is the, recommend what is the recommended procedure for reuniting families? Yeah, so there, um, we actually do part of reunification, whether it's here at the school or off-site, we do recommend that you come to retrieve your child. The process of that and the flow is on us and first responders, so your law enforcement and your fire department. Order and calmness really is, is the key. Um, what we saw play out Thursday, um, our opportunities, we had a lot of people coming to the front entrance, trying to steer them through the welcome center and then one at a time. The breakdown that we saw, our area for improvement, was we had a lot of parents communicating directly with their child on cell phone, saying, hey, just leave. Leave the classroom, I'm out here, I need to see you, I need to touch you. Um, the school's moving slow on the runners, we call them runners, in the chain of command of things. So they're going and retrieving kids from classrooms, we're calling on the radio saying, hey, it's all clear. Um, I know some parents, parents got irritated because a teacher would get on the phone and say, listen, I can't just verbally release your child. Again, let's double back and think about, you're someone that means harm. Or if the building hasn't, you know, if something's still going on, police presence still in the building, if we just start letting kids run for the hills, then we get a missing child later in the day, parent calls, said, hey, my kid never come home from all of this. Now we're in a much bigger conversation, aren't we? So it really does have to be single file. Now when we work on reunification, we are working on batches of kids. So we can take, we can do a little bit better. Thursday, that was spur of the moment, and we literally had our front office staff there doing the best they could, but it was one at a time because we were keeping careful control of attendance. Brian's team were keeping an eye on every child that's leaving the property and who they're leaving with. That does take time. So it is a slow burn, I promise you that, but it's one that legally, like on the other side of Uvalde, there'll be lots of lawsuits there. We don't need lawsuits out of just reunifying people that just want their kid. So we do have legal things that we follow and it's very regimented. Um, so we do recommend you come here, but then please just stay in order, stay calm. We want to get you with your child also. The other thing is what we noticed on Thursday was that some neighbors were picking up mom would call their neighbor and say, go get Susie, whoever. If that Susie, uh, the neighbor is not listed on Susie's medical emergency card, we cannot let them go. And so that caused some points of frustration because parents wanted their kids home. We didn't have the legal authority to release them to who showed up at the school. So if you want to expand who you want to release your child to, please you know, do that through the, through the um, progress book, um, the Power School online application process that you start at the beginning of the year. If you have trouble with changing anything, please call your attendance secretary at the schools and they're very happy to help you with that. 
Um, Brian, a question for you. Can you explain um, the top of the policy with regard to fighting? How do we plan to improve the continued problem with the amount of fights in schools? Sure. Uh, so that goes to code of conduct uh, piece. I will say, um, you know, last year we did have some fights, um, and you know, I would also say uh, those are taken very seriously. Um, any fight that we had that occurred. Uh, between uh, students, uh, and if there were a, a staff member uh, that had an injury, uh, we had uh, that occur in a few instances, uh, police charges were filed. Uh, that is part of our code of conduct, and it's something we take very seriously. Something I take very seriously. Um, so a couple of things uh, that I think are proactive approaches rather than being reactive to fighting. Um, number one, being open, honest, and transparent. Uh, number two, our administrative staff circulates in the hallways. Um, at, at class changes. Um, we do ask our teachers to be outside and vigilant um, during those types of things. And of course, um, you know, see something, say something. Um, then also there's pretty severe consequences for students who do fight in school. Um, one thing I do want to highlight, uh, it's something that didn't occur when I was in school. I went to public school in Worcester, Ohio, there were fights that occurred. I do think that social media uh, magnifies that. I'm just being very honest. Um, and that can take scenarios that are dealt with uh, they're dealt with in-house, severe consequences. Students understand that, and they're told that, um, that there are severe consequences. I think that mitigates a lot of that. Um, however, if you take a social media soundbite of a, a specific situation, and we know we have kids, right? That's what kids do, okay? Boom, cell phone, record, um, and that occurs. So I think that that magnifies the situation sometimes. I've had conversations with parents who are wonderful, um, and they call and they say, you know, what is going on with all of these fights? And I would say, well, how many do you think there are? Well, there's hundreds. Well, that's not the case. Um, so I think you have to be um, open and honest. You have to own it. Um, you, there are consequences for students who are not acting accordingly, and those consequences are severe. Um, and then there's a proactive approach of people talking to kids, being vigilant, seeing kids. Um, and then there's also just the reality of um, if we see something on social media, of course it's going to alarm us, but uh, we have to understand that that is not always the case and it magnifies the situation. Now, Brian, one of the questions here, along with student discipline, is what happens to a student that causes, that induces panic, such as what happened last week? So we can't talk specifics about students from last week, but the code of conduct would provide us direction, right? Sure, so I, I think that that is uh, a big piece uh, and again, I would encourage all parents, um, but you know, we have very, uh, there are legal consequences uh, for those students. There are also severe school consequences. Part of that is due process, where we have to afford that student due process, and it's a very legal process. You can't just say, boom, you did it, you're done, you know, here's the consequences. So we, of course, that, that's an interview process, but our code of conduct is set up in, in the event of something uh, of this nature, where there are legal consequences, there are severe school consequences. And when I say school consequences, you may take that from a one-day suspension to a 10-day suspension with a, rec with a referral to the superintendent for expulsion. Um, we don't take that lightly, but those are, that's the most severe consequence you could have. Uh, and, and, and again, that is a hearing, that's an opportunity for the, that student, uh, the parent, the guardian, to plead their case. Um, but those are something that when the code of conduct is broken, when the code of conduct is broken in a severe scenario, that that is taken, and I can't get specifics about each scenario, but I can speak to me personally, our administrative team, we take those very seriously, and we, we make those recommendations on that sliding scale that if it is a severe violation of the student code of conduct, that affects the safety and security of every single person in our building, all of our students, and so the recommendations that we issue, and again, I can't give like specifics for this, are, are in correlation with the behavior that, that caused that recommendation. Thank you. Um, this next question is from Matt, and it talks about um, the Wi-Fi reception in this room. It talks about on Thursday, we had um, a large group of students here, they were moving the comments into this room. So Wi-Fi reception was an issue in the auditorium. How, how can the school communicate successfully with staff and students um, who may get locked down in spotty reception areas. So I guess the question is what kind of audit are we doing to make sure that's not an issue? Yeah, so one, if there's silver linings to anything like this, it's when a district or business is honest enough to audit themselves. 
Um, you gotta take a hard look in the mirror and then fix what you see. Um, we, Brian, within the day, had put out a survey to staff. What did you see? Give us the good, the bad, and the ugly, but the bad and the ugly are our fixables, right? So Wi-Fi would be something like that. So when we talk about handheld radios, that's gonna solve communication issues. As you all know, if you go to a concert or anything, when you flood an area with cell phone reception, your Wi-Fi and your cellular are gonna be competing with each other and your service is gonna be bad. I suspect that's a lot of what was going on Thursday, um, but what that does is it triggers all of our departments to do a self audit. So doors, Wi-Fi, PA system, everything's on the table. So we look at feedback like that. I'll get with our tech team. You know, where are we at with our bandwidth in here? We don't typically have issues, so my guess would be it was the draw on the system all concentrated in one place, one time. Um, but we have plenty of technology to audit our technology. So we can check bandwidth, and if it's more than a problem than that, we'll certainly take care of it. Next question goes to Brian. Um, has the debasement of school property bathroom issues at the high school improved from last year? And what is being done to address this? Yes, I would say the, the simple answer is yes. Um, you know, uh, that was an interesting challenge for last year, I'm just being very honest. I've never heard of devious licks or TikTok challenges, and I'll just speak to my communication with other suburban league principals about some of the defacement of property. And this is across you know, Summit County, the suburban league, where principals were like, I'm gonna quit. <laughs> like, I, don't, I don't understand this. You know, it's just, it's something as an adult you can't even comprehend, right? How did the kid watch this? How did they think this was funny? How are they so desensitized to vandalism, those types of things? Um, I worked very close with superintendent powers last year and just, you know, some of the things that were going on, I'm like, you know, and, and a credit to us, I do believe we are so transparent as a district. You know, there are other things that happen sometimes that, that, that people aren't sending that out, but I still remember uh, the Blackboard Connect that I sent about the bathrooms and students, you know, defecating on the floor in the bathrooms. That has not occurred one time this year. Um, I haven't had one instance of vandalism in our restrooms. Um, I feel that some of our color-coded one-at-a-time pass procedure has mitigated some of that. Um, I also think that students have been um, really, uh, they've had re-entry into pro-social behavior and understanding that you know, I'm not going to sit there and watch the, someone vandalizing something on the screen. Um, and they also understood, I, you know, a credit to the community. Uh, so many parents reached out to us and um, some of our custodial staff, you know, pizza, uh, and, and just really also engaging our students. You know, that was a very, 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 very limited portion of students that engaged in that type of behavior, but it's so appalling that it, it really kind of it hits you in your gut. So the short answer is yes. Um, we have had no incidents of vandalism uh, in that regard at all uh, this year. Um, so I'm very pleased about that. Thank you. Next set of questions has to do with classroom doors, and this is um, across the district. Um, process that we're using to audit to make sure that the doors are all locking. Um, what happens if uh, we have a, a perpetrator in the building and the lock is Okay, so the audit um, is going on between our head custodians, janitors, and principals. And we, we had asked them to do was go through and test everything um, for functionality. Now I'll tell you, again, with what went on this past week, functionality is not, not enough. Um, we have to get now a door company and the fire department in here because what we learned was in some of our buildings, the high school's an example, some of the locks are functioning fine. Physically, stick a key in it, locks on locks. But when you talk about 20 plus year old building, what the doors were made for then versus what safety protocol is now, some of those locks don't make great sense for the staff that have to work in those spaces. So functionally, it works. It works the way it was designed to work. But when you talk through it in an emergency, you go, this isn't great. <laughs> this isn't keeping us safe. Now we've got a company in the fire department coming out to say, within code, what can we do to change it to make it safe 
um, 2022 sale. So that's our response to that. So the audit has been checked not only functionality, but common sense safety approach of our door handles and locks. Um, that's ongoing. Um, those purchases, those vendors are coming in, fire department, everybody's coming in, we're on that. Um, as far as if something breaks down, if someone gains access, that is where Alice Training comes in and how we're educating our children and our educators that if the barrier between an attacker and the kids and staff is broken, that's where our Alice Training, our fight and flight takes in. Um, we hope they will either have evacuated or Alice training focuses also on environmental weapons, things in a classroom that can be used to fight someone off. Uh, an officer, officer Priscilla talked about um, distracting someone, things that can be thrown. We talk about this with our students and parents. And I know that's a squeamish topic, but it's the real deal. Um, so that's, that's what we hope for in the event of a breakdown of the barrier. Thank you. Brian, this next question has to do with your new student ID badges. Question is, uh, or statement is, please give more information on how student IDs will be used to enhance safety at Woodsburg High School. Sure. So we um, recently uh, have obtained uh, ID badges for all students grades nine through twelve. Uh, we are issuing those at lunch uh, to our students, uh, and we're asking the students to keep their student ID on them uh, at all times throughout the day. Uh, I'm a principal of 1,300 kids and a father of two. Uh, so I understand uh, that some students might have that challenge, but we're going to consistently reinforce that, that piece. Um, there was a conversation, of course, about lanyards. Um, we decided that we're not going to be the lanyard police, um, you know, just because of the, the, the nature of, of what that looks like uh, and, and I guess feels like in that instance. Um, I'm sure there'll be some feedback on that. Uh, in terms of how it's going to be used to increase safety and security at Twinsburg High School, all students should have their ID on them at, at, at all times. In the event that a security, security liaison, a teacher, or principal uh, asks any student, excuse me, I don't recognize you today, can you, you, know, you have your student ID? Those types of things. Um, if that student wouldn't be able to produce their ID, um, then we would have that, that student escorted to the office. Because um, this year is a lot better, I will say. Uh, we're coming off COVID, we're all in masks, we had a hard time having you know, new, new teachers, new administrators, that. Uh, but I feel that we work really, really hard to get to know our students and recognize the majority of the students who come in our building. building. However, there are 13, almost 1,400 students, and there are going to be times where I don't recognize a student or someone doesn't recognize a student. Um, you're walking the hallway, excuse me, um, a young man or a young lady, or, um, excuse me, can you can I see your ID? Where are you supposed to be? Those types of things. And it's simply, it's another layer of check. Um, and, and so that is uh, the genesis of it, um, and we're going to go through that process. For sure. Thank you. Um, actually, this is a question for Mr. Desmond. The question was, when will the kids get their Z passes? Weren't those all distributed already? Yeah, I collected those Z passes for the help of the principals at the beginning of the year. We painstakingly uh, organized them alphabetically, passed them out back to the schools, and they're handing them out to the managers. Uh, these passes have technology in them. Some of the little ones, they lose them every now and then. So we're in the process of replacing them. I've seen them where they got chewed up by uh, pets and things like that, uh, and punched holes in them. So uh, just a little patience and we'll get them all out to you, okay? So if your child has not received them yet, it's a process of administration pushing them out to the kids? Correct. Yes? Okay, thank you. It was hard to hear you, sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. No problem. Um, question for Mr. Lynn, can there be better security when the students attending CBCC come back and enter Twinsburg High School? Uh, yeah, this is the first time I'm hearing that. Um, so I think that we could look at the process of when they come back, where they report to, um, and how we engage our security liaisons, uh, both at the Walker Center um, to, as they return to, to THS. So they come in back through the Walker Center? Yes. They're not coming in through the common stores? Correct. Um, question, Mr. Lynn, how are clear backpacks helping when students have instrument cases and sports bags? This is a good question. Um, so regarding clear backpacks, we've been very intentional about that. So there's a lot of feedback uh, from the, the staff, from students. And, and so this year, last year was only clear backpacks. This year you can have a locker. Um, so it's very easy uh, if a student does not have a clear backpack that they were assigned a locker. So we came on extremely intentional about that. 
So, and I asked my administrative staff during class change, um, and it, I would say this, it has been very, very good, um, but you can't get complacent. Um, I say, you know, if you walk and there's not a clear backpack, uh, then you need to confiscate that clear backpack because that child had, you know, now two weeks uh, of an opportunity. Um, so that is one of the things we've been very consistent about. Um, and I do think the clear backpacks are a good quid pro quo and the fact that it lets kids that want to have their backpack carry the backpack. Uh, students do have in instrument cases um, that they do leave in the band room, um, and that is a reality. In terms of athletic bags, uh, checking into the building, uh, we do have um, our security, one of our security liaisons every morning where the students that come in, and this is protocol starting school, where they lock those athletic bags into uh, the locker room. So that's where those are secured. Um, so we have protocols in place, athletic bags locked in the locker rooms uh, early, instruments in the band room, and then clear backpacks in the hallways that we consistently enforce throughout the day. Thank you. Um, Officer Purcella, you're gonna, um, if you don't mind, you're going to end up close this out because the next set of questions is all about Alice. Sorry. Um, so, and honestly about the, the hold in place from last week. The question was, why at Twinsburg High School did a hold in place occur, meaning the students had to stay in the auditorium or classrooms and not run outside if there was a weapon possibly on campus? Good question. The reality of it is, we weren't sure if there was a weapon on campus. So, the last thing we wanted to do was evacuate our building and or barricade ourselves in if we were going to barricade ourselves into a scenario where law enforcement was going to have to get into a classroom. And we were in search of um, some students that we wanted to speak to, and the last thing we wanted to do was set them out. So there are situations that a hold in place allows us to control the environment. It allows us to control the environment. We have law enforcement already in the building. So there's the difference between when we have a known active situation and then a situation where we want to control the environment and then we're further investigating what is happening. And that's what happened. That was the difference um, between last week. Thank you. So that concludes our program for this evening. Um, if you have questions or thoughts suggestions about school security, we invite you please to go on to that um, online survey that was launched yesterday through the Blackboard Connect for me. Please offer your feedback. Please provide your comments. Those comments will be shared first with the Board of Education, then with the community as a whole. As we continue to evolve our school district and our safety and security protocols, your feedback is extremely important to us. Thank you for spending the evening with us tonight. We hope to see you soon at one of our school activities. Have a great evening, everybody.